So welcome everyone to the Penn State College of Medicine Understanding Primary Immunodeficiency. Deficiency. It's a Project ECHO Clinician Education Series and we're delighted to have you join us for what's the last session in this series. My name is Jackie and I'm a member of the ECHO team and I'll start us off with our announcements and introductions. Um, if you've not already done so, please put your name in the chat for our record keeping. Um, and if anybody is joining with you, please include their names as well. Um, we ask that you stay muted unless you're speaking. You can also use the chat for communicating. Please remember that when we're discussing cases, no personally identifiable information is allowed. We are recording these sessions for educational and quality improvement purposes, and we share all materials after the session. In the spirit of Project Echo's I'll Teach, I'll Learn approach, we're always on a first name basis during our sessions. So today we're going to have a review of what we've learned. Um, Paul is going to be sharing that with us. And then she also has a case for our discussion. Again, during the presentation and case, feel free to put your questions into the chat. We have a team of specialists online and they're going to help field questions. But remember, this is all teach all learn so everyone can share questions and answers. So let me do our, our quick hub introductions and then we will go ahead and get started. Um, so let's just start with Colleen. Hi everyone. I am Colleen Brock. I am the manager of medical programs at IDF. I am a registered nurse. I am a mother to two young adults with CVID, and I also have CVID. So thank you for being here today. Thank you. Um, how about Ken? Good morning. My name is Ken Bass, and I am a patient with common variable immunodeficiency. I also work with IDF as a support group leader for other people with PI uh, here in Texas. Thank you, Diana. My name is Diana and I am the parent of a child with PI. Thank you, um, Alyssa. Hi everyone, my name is Alyssa Creamer. I'm the Senior Director of Education and Community Services at IDF. I oversee lots of our patients and patient and community focused programming. So it's great to be here and see you all. Thank you. Um, and Paula, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. And while you're doing that, um, Melissa could go ahead and get your slides ready for you. Hi, I'm Paula Now I'm uh, one of the physicians at Hershey Medical Center in Allergy and Immunology. Um, and I'll be giving our flash talk today. So really throughout this um, series that has been 10 lectures, um, we've really tried to, in a short overview of, of the immune system, um, learn as much as we can to provide uh, primary care providers, other providers that are not immunologists, uh, so, uh, some understanding of primary immunodeficiency so that we don't overlook them. Um, and so today we're gonna do a summary of what we have learned so far um, throughout this 10-week uh, series. It is gonna be not inclusive of everything we learned, obviously, but just trying to get um, an idea and then you know, welcome any questions uh, throughout. So we did review through our lecture a brief overview of primary immunodeficiency and addressed common manifestations, which I think is the key concept here. Um, of primary immunodeficiency so that as providers that are not immunologists, we don't miss those things, um, those alarm signals, and um, figure out when it's appropriate to either do more testing or refer or ask more questions to our IDF program. Um, we did address briefly some um, goals and management, uh, reviewed the importance and the newly available newborn screening efforts, and did discuss the social determinants of health and um, how teamwork is really important in managing these complex entities. Next slide. Okay, so in terms of a bird's eye view of primary immunodeficiencies, we can have issues with the innate immune system and with the adaptive immune system. In terms of our innate immune system, these are more rare immunodeficiencies um, that um, are, are due to uh, certainly uh, physical barrier issues, but, but more importantly is uh, phagocytic defect, natural killer uh, cell defect, complement uh, defect, and these tend to have recurrent uh, fungal and bacterial infections. 
um, in the case of complement, we tend to have a significant um, encapsulated um, organism infections. Um, and in the adaptive immunity, which is really what we see more often in primary immunodeficiency, we reviewed issues with T cell defects and B cell def defects, with the B cell defect primary immunodeficiency being much more common. Next slide. So when do we suspect uh, primary immunodeficiency? And when we reviewed this, it's key. This is, I think, one of our key slides. Um, so things that raise alarms is infections that are too frequently, too frequent, or infections that are unusual. So by too frequent, there's not ma a magic number, but in general, um, two severe infections per year, um, three sinopulmonary infections per year, we tend to not want someone to have more than one pneumonia in their life, um, unless they have like a severe a lung disease, a, you know, have severe COPD in that case, they're more prone to certain things like pneumonia. But in general, we want someone to have, um, you know, we give them a pass for the first pneumonia. Um, but if they have two pneumonias, that requires um, a primary immunodeficiency evaluation. And then certainly infections that are unusual. So opportunistic infections, strange bugs, Burkle various sepatias, a known um, trigger for chronic granulomatous disease um, or uh, cystic fibrosis. All right, next slide. And then we um, discuss specifically, um, as mentioned before, um, there's certain types of infections that give you more an index of suspicion for one defect versus another. In the case of T-cell defect, which we call cellular immunodeficiency, you tend to have opportunistic infections. Um, it's important to remember that T-cells really are the um, coordinators of a lot of the immune system, and they really um, are able to trigger the functioning of neutrophils, of cinephils, all of these cells that then um, need further uh, emphasis by, by T cells themselves. They also direct B cells. So a T cell defect can be really quite profound and can have a whole array of different um, infections that are severe as well as significant opportunistic infections. Whereas B cell immunodeficiency, which is the most common, we tend to see recurrent sinopulmonary infections with encapsulated organisms. That's our big trigger. This is where we see pneumonias and sinus infections. We can also have certain viral infections because antibodies do clear viruses as long as the viruses are not intracellular. And so we could see enteroviral infections at an increased rate. Um, and Giardia um, can be another um, important infection. Um, as well as mycoplasma and neuroplasma infections. Next slide. So we did also discuss that autoimmunity raises alarms for the potential of common variable immunodeficiency and that certain types of autoimmune diseases are more likely to be concerning for an underlying primary immunodeficiency. So in terms of when to screen when you have a primary immunodeficiency in a patient or when to screen for a primary immunodeficiency in a patient with autoimmune disease. It's not every single adult patient that comes with rheumatoid arthritis, but there are diseases in which you do have to be concerned about um, screening for primary immunodeficiency in certain cases. And those include, in all patients, those with autoimmune hepatitis and arthritis, interstitial lung disease, those with a very strong family history of autoimmune disease, and very importantly, those with bowel enteropathy that is not gluten-sensitive so, um, or gluten-responsive. So in patients with, um, there's a very clear bowel enteropathy that um, it, that can have, a, and specifically in the small bowel, that can have significant blunting of the villi that looks exactly like celiac disease. But when you have 
complete avoidance of gluten, there's no improvement. And I've had several patients with this type of enteropathy where we later check them for a primary immunodeficiency and we do indeed have common variable immunodeficiency. Autoimmune cytopenias are another thing to be very concerned about in terms of a potential for screening for primary immunodeficiency. And then if you have a child that's under the age of five with an autoimmune condition, that's another time where it makes sense to screen for primary immunodeficiency. Next slide. All right. So I think many of you asked throughout the series, hey, I have um, concern for primary immunodeficiency. It's not super easy to get access to an immunologist. What can I go ahead and order first? It depends truly in terms of what, what you're thinking. Um, so what disease process, et cetera. However, there are some things to get you started. So you, can, you won't go wrong with checking an HIV, um, checking an IgG, IgM, IgA, um, and then checking for vaccine titers. That's a start. Um, and it can really be the most helpful for the vast majority of patients. You can really get a lot of information just that. Um, certainly consider allergies as a possibility, um, and then consider malignancy as another possibility. But the other important thing is that we're here to help. So um, the Immune Deficiency Foundation has a consultant in immunology uh, program that can be really helpful uh, for uh, further questions with primary immune deficiency and getting you the expert help that you need. And certainly, um, referral to an immunologist when you have a strong index of suspicion makes a lot of sense. Next slide. So we did go over um, some management goals in primary immunodeficiency, and this can help you think about when you're having this um, primary immunodeficiency in some of your patients and they're already getting therapy either by an immunologist or um, you're trying to manage it on your own. Um, in terms of management, the core concepts are prophylaxis, replacement, and cure. So, and and they depend on the type of immunodeficiency, which which um, one of these you're going to try to target. So, prophylaxis really um, refers to either vaccines or prophylactic antibiotics to prevent infections. We can use prophylactic antibiotics for things like common variable immunodeficiency when they don't end up um, deciding to go on um, immunoglobulin replacement. Um, or um, in cases of uh, complement deficiency, we can also do that as well. For vaccines, vaccines can be very important. And in patients that are not on um, replacement therapy specific, particularly, and we really do, for patients with complement deficiency, we do hyper-vaccination. So meaning we really emphasize some of this, um, making sure that they're getting all of the uh, vaccines for the encapsulated bacteria for the most part. It's critically important for complement deficiencies because we don't have any other treatment for them. Um, but it is important that live vaccines are contraindicated in certain types of primary immunodeficiencies, mm -hmm. specifically those with T-cell defects. So we have to be aware of that. Replacement really focuses um, on immunoglobulin replacement where we get a pool of thousands of, um, of blood from thousands of people around the world and it gets synthesized in, in Germany um, into a, just the IgG product. And then the IgG is insert, inserted in our, in our patients directly. Um, this can be administered um, via um, IV or subcutaneously and really can prevent uh, a lot of the severe bacterial infections and can help prevent some of the fungal infections, um, interviral infections as well. Um, and then in terms of cure, um, really for some of the most severe immunodeficiencies, particularly we think about it in um, chronic granulomatous disease, um, severe combined immunodeficiency, so T cell defects um, that are life threatening early on in life. Uh, we want uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation as the curative option. Um, 
sinus transplantation can be a, also considered a, a curative option for those patients with complete dejoinage, where they were ch children that are born without a thymus. Um, and then there's some emergent gene uh, therapies that are uh, strategies for specific genes. Next slide. So important that newborn screening is now available in all 50 states. Um, and those that you know, that take care of the pediatric population, um, this is going to be really quite important. Newborn screening is done through TREC analysis that quantifies DNA byproducts of naive T cells. And um, it is not specific for severe combined immunodeficiency. It can identify other types of um, T cell uh, lymphopenia. Um, and um, Therefore, it requires a further evaluation. But why um, newborn screening was accepted in all 50 states is because early recognition of severe combined immunodeficiency allows for a change in management and outcome. So those patients that received an allogeneric uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplant for SCID before three and a half months of age um, and that are infection free actually have much better outcomes than those that receive it later in life. And therefore, this can be not only a curative approach, but really quite, it's important to recognize it very early in life so we can prevent certain uh, issues that can arise. Next slide. So um, finally, we did discuss um, that because primary immunodeficiency is so complex, we've discussed that it affects the lungs. It can affect, cause autoimmune hemolytic anemia, liver um, issues, um, and um, autoimmune conditions, that it really takes a village to be able to take care of a patient with primary immunodeficiency. And some patients, you know, if you have straightforward common variable immunodeficiency and all you need is replacement and you're otherwise healthy, they just need an immunologist and with coordinating care with their primary care provider. However, many, many patients, as their disease progresses and they have more complications, do require a whole village of um, different physicians and providers throughout a different field to coordinate their care. Next slide. We discussed also uh, social determinants of health and how that can um, cause a significant complexity in our recognition of primary immunodeficiency, including delay of diagnosis, uh, but also um, not allowing people to have the most cutting edge uh, therapies early on in their disease. All right, next slide. So in summary, um, we went over um, that a detailed history and physical exam can help us identify patients in either primary care clinic or an immunology and cl pulmonology clinic or wherever you're currently working require further examination for primary immunodeficiency. And this is key so that they get early referral and they can get management and appropriate care for their condition. Newborn screening is available in all 50 states and early diagnosis is key um, because they can improve outcomes. And management for primary immunodeficiency just is so complex. It does require us all to collaborate together uh, so that our patients can have the best outcomes. Finally, when in doubt, refer to an immunologist, coordinate care with your immunologist, and importantly, feel free to contact our IDF Consulting Immunologist Program as we're here to help. Next slide. Okay, so I wanted to take a pause here and ask if anybody has any questions um, about any of what we have talked about or anything in the series. Hello, how are you? 
Good, good. My name is Patrice Simmons. I'm a community health worker. Um, I've been working in the medical field probably since I started working all my life. Um, so I just had a question. Um, so I, I've known a patient that had like very, really, really severe sinus problems and it's been ongoing. The patient had its adenoids removed and is still ongoing congestion, sinus problems. And as a community health worker, I'm not sure how to help this patient interact with their primary doctor to try to kind of like prompt or see if the primary doctor can do further testing because I don't know exactly, you know, like I don't know much about this, about sinuses and, you know, how to really, really direct the question to the primary care doctor. That's, that's a great question. I'm glad that you asked. Um, Colleen might be able to give us more information on that front, but, and, and Ken. Oh, Ken, why don't you go ahead and lead us? I, I am a patient with common variable, and that was my precondition. Uh, I've had three sinus surgeries. They've done um, the cutting out part of the sinuses to try and help. I can tell you that in my case, the um, the primary care usually refers to an uh, ENT so that they can get the sinuses examined to find out if there are any physical reasons why there are sinus uh, problems. Uh, but from there, it was just a fact that um, you keep getting infection after infection. The year that I was diagnosed, I all but five weeks of that year, I had an infection and was getting treated with antibiotics. So um, sinus infection is definitely a sign. Uh, and again, in my case, they're going to, the primary care is going to first make you see an ENT. And then from the ENT, it went to an immunologist. That was my experience. Okay. All right. Thank you. I didn't know. Does Colleen have something more? <laughs> I think the, the other thing to consider is if, like Kenton's situation, this person is having recurrent infection after infection after infection, then it is time to go back to the basics of what we talked about when we first started and doing that immune profile panel, drawing their IgG levels, looking at those levels, and then getting them to do the vaccine challenge to see if their function is there. Now, how do you help that person make the connection? You can do it one of a couple ways. IDF is a great resource. And we have a program, a resource that is called Find a Clinician. So they can go into the website for IDF, primaryimmune.org, and click on the Find a Clinician tab you can put in your zip code, how far you're willing to travel, what kind of specialist you are looking for, in this case, an immunologist. And the people who fall into that category who are in our database will show up and then encourage them to make an appointment with that immunologist. I think going that route is a shorter route than going to the ENT and then to the immunologist they may want you to still see an, an ENT if they have not and work together with them. But I think one of the things is to start with finding out truly if this is a primary immune deficiency. Does that help? Yes, it does. Um, I just need to get, you said it's I as in igloo, D as in door and F as in Frank. Correct. Okay. Or the uh, Immune Deficiency Foundation. <laughs> immune, okay. All right. Yes, that was great. <laughs> Very insightful. But I appreciate it. We also have the resource, con the Consulting Immunology Program mm -hmm. is where if their doctor is stumped, and even if it's their PCP, mm -hmm. if, if they're stumped as to, okay, this is what's going on. We've tried X, Y, and Z. They're not working I, I don't know what to do. They can go again onto the website for IDF and they can submit a request to have an immunologist talk to them about their patient. 
and there's a whole link. It tells you how to fill it out, what kind of questions you want answered. That physician that I assign them to responds to that other clinician within 48 hours. And they will go back and forth as long as it takes to make sure that patient is on the right track to getting good health care. And it's all free. Okay. All it's right. just that the patient themselves cannot use that. That is strictly clinician to clinician. Okay. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Oh, you're it. welcome. I put... um both links to the IDF clinician finder, as well as the consulting immunologist program in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So if anybody wants to click on those links, they'll open up in your web browser and then you won't lose them um, when the Zoom closes. I know the notes get sent out, but if you need them now, they're there for you. Thanks, Thanks. Alyssa. Wonderful. Anybody else with any questions um, before we move on with our case? And anything is valid, anything within the, the series. Paula, I had a question. Yes. Um, from, from this whole series, I heard two providers saying they're getting away from saying primary immunodeficiency and moving mm. over to IEI, the inborn errors of immunity. Mm -hmm. And I tried searching on my own. I saw that IDF had a good explanation of that. But as you know, I always say I'm the mother of a child with PI. What exactly is the difference or is there a difference? Um, oh, goodness. I think this is, this is, uh, Colleen, could you help me with this? Because honestly, I'm actually not super familiar with why that's um, been preferred or changing. Um, so, so un, unsure what, why the lingo, and it might be more, um, is, it, is it more like, a, Colleen, is that more like a patient um, motivated, patient centered sort of, or what, what's the, I, I'm not sure, actually, um, to be perfectly honest. I'm sorry, I was trying to answer a question that popped up into the the chat, so I'd miss it. Are you talking about IEI? So, so this is, yeah. Okay. Do we refer, so, why do we refer to it that way? And usually these changes in, in medicine, the way we say a word or something is because um, a, it's a patient's, patient groups prefer something other than right. the other, but I don't know necessarily in well, this case. Well, this came up this weekend at our escape and it is a conversation that is occurring everywhere. The immunology community, they started to use it to include hyper and hypo situations. So if you say primary immunodeficiency, you automatically think that the problem is a deficiency, but there are certain issues with the immune system that is too much. Hyper IgE syndrome is an example. There's too much. So the researchers and the clinical immunologists came up with this term, inborn errors of immunity, to encompass every dysregulation, every deficiency, and every abundance of something going on in the immune system. Having said that, it is really receiving a lot of pushback. I expect it will change because the patient end of it, they do not like it because they're not a mistake. They're not an error. And so they're kind of offended by it. And it seems very negative. And there are a lot of immunologists that are hearing that and understand that, and also kind of feel that that term, they understand the reasoning behind it. They're just hoping they can come up with a better overall umbrella terminology that will include all of those three categories, the deficiency, the overabundance, and the dysregulation. So that's you're going to hear IEI more in literature, especially if it's research or if it is in a medical journal 
then you will hear commonplace. So IDF is not using it. We are using PI that we've always used. And um, the hope, like I said, is that because there is so much pushback that they will come up with a different term. Thank you. I just didn't understand, you know, some of the providers that were saying that's what we're calling it now. And I, right. I just didn't understand if there was a difference or if it was a genetic no. component or it was just meant to be one word that encompasses all three of those things. But like I said, the word error is the one that's rubbing people wrong. Okay. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, so should we get started on our Melissa, would you be able to put up my slides? Um, excuse me one second, um, Paula. I thank you for putting that into the chat. Um, do you mind reading that? Because for the recordings, no one would see that information that you shared. Sorry? Oh, to, to the question about, and um, answer. The, perfect, for sure. So, so Tammy asked a wonderful question about a patient that um, gained 35 pounds in two months um, after starting sub-Q immunoglobulin replacement therapy. So this, this is not a known side effect from the immunoglobulin replacement product. So we mentioned um, essentially a blood product where we're still you know, globulins, um, a bit starting them to just give that um, boost to, to the immune system. Um, and it, one, one thought potentially is if someone is very sick, potentially, I don't know this specific case, um, and has been having a lot of infections, having poor appetite, and then she started on the product, um, she could have increased appetite from being less sick, having less infections. Um, however, if, if that's not doesn't explain the full picture, then I would look for alternative causes uh, uh, and continue the immunoglobulin replacement product. It is really important to note that the immunoglobulin replacement product is dosed in a based weight, in a weight form. Um, and so especially more relevant in children, typically as they grow, we adjust the product. Um, but in adults, if they have a significant weight case gain, a significant weight loss, we do consider um, changing the dosage of the product. Okay. So we're going to move on to our case. Um, so I, I'm excited to uh, talk about this uh, patient. This is a patient of mine um, and has been for several years. Um, and so when he presented, he was a 12-year-old. Um, Hispanic boy um, presenting to clinic for the first time um, in our genealogy clinic. Um, and he and his mother only speak Spanish. Now, he has had pneumonia three times, but all episodes have been treated with antibiotics at home. Um, and he's never required emergency room visits or hospitalizations. And two times he had had uh, cutaneous abscesses that required uh, incision and drainage with good results. Um, otherwise, he's a very active boy, um, doesn't have a diagnosis of asthma, breathing is fine, running around, doing well, um, and actually really enjoys running um, at 12 and then goes on to be in track later on. Um, so, any thoughts? What would you start ordering? Feel free to interrupt. If not, I'll move forward. But I want to give some some time to um, think about this and what would you order based on what we've learned so far. I'll start it, Paula with the red flag that jumps out, out straight out of the screen and that is the pneumonia. And if you can touch on why just that in of itself is a big red flag so that everybody understands, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. So so as we talked about earlier, um, for patients with primary immunodeficiency, or I'm sorry, for, for all people, um, we it's it's normal to 
potentially have pneumonia once in your life. If it's a chest x-ray, it could confirm pneumonia. So I, I've heard people say, oh, I get pneumonia all the time. And I'm like, well, did they do a chest x-ray? Did we see findings of pneumonia? And that's a big key difference. So if we have a chest x-ray confirmed pneumonia one time, that is a pass. If we have chest x-ray confirmed pneumonia twice, um, that is concerning. It, it's not supposed to be like a, a, a a healthy adult or a healthy a human should not be having more than one pneumonia in their lifetime. And that at least raises um, some hairs in the back of my skull saying, hey, this is for evaluation. Oh, this is a great, um, so someone mentioned, remember to ask if the child had all the recommended vaccines um, early in childhood. So this child did, but that's a great point. Um, absolutely. I'm curious about the abscesses because I've had them and yeah, always not. wondered if they were associated with my uh, disease. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So we'll go into what, what this patient had in a, in a second, but yeah. So any others? Paula, I'm not sure uh, how up to date you are with the whole RSV vaccine and as far as mm -hmm. immunology related, but that's going to be a hot topic right now. Can you address what clinicians should be doing and looking for with that vaccine? So would you be, because I don't do pediatrics, so I'm actually not as well versed. So tell us more, Colleen. So, um, and I'm looking to see if I flagged, I did. The RSV, RSV vaccine, what IDF is now saying, um, having talked to our medical advisory committee is, thank you, Alyssa, <laughs> is thank you, Alyssa. that, uh, you need to speak with your immunologist as to mm -hmm. your health conditions and getting the vaccine because it is now available and it is a vaccine mm -hmm. that you can get as somebody with a PI. It is, it is not a live mm -hmm. virus vaccine. Mm -hmm. So it is definitely something as a clinician to discuss with your population over the age of 60, especially. I think, and Paula, you'll know more as far as, is the RSV vaccine going to be just an, an option as a child or as is it going to be mandated that you're gonna put that into the regular routine vaccines? Yeah, so thank you for bringing this up, Colleen, because um, I'm actually not yet including this as part of my immunodeficiency. I think it is um, something that uh, we can consider in the future. I tend to, um, with my patients, so most of my patients, so because they're adults, most of them have common variable immunodeficiency. Um, and so because they're already on immunoglobulin replacement product, um, something like RSV is already in the product and can can help curtail that doesn't mean that they can't and shouldn't get the vaccine but it's um i i press on um patients with prime uh, with common variable immunodeficiency in terms of certain vaccines a little bit less so i recommend the influenza vaccine every year because um it's it's a, a new strain, and so I'm hoping that even though they can't mount a vaccine response as well, they may mount some. But there are others like pneumonia, for instance, where hey, there's so much pneumonia in the population. Usually, it's pneumococcal pneumonia, and that's what the vaccine covers. And so I don't think it's necessarily all that helpful if they're already getting regular immunoglobulin replacement product. Most immunologists feel this way. I mean, some will be more aggressive about vaccinations and pressing their patients like, let's do it. But in patients that really won't mount an immune response, um, the immunoglobulin replacement product is much more important. Now, there are other conditions in which uh, significant vaccination it's going to be a lot more relevant, especially if they're not able or eligible for um, immunoglobulin replacement 
products. Are, I'm glad that you brought this up. I will be incorporating Buddha probably in my practice moving forward, but it's not something that I'm regularly doing just yet. Okay. Thank you. All right. So um, anybody, so I, I guess my question was more, what would you order? What are your thoughts in this mm -hmm. patient's case? Any, any immune deficiency that maybe you're thinking about and what are your thoughts and is there is there something that you would order? Okay. So next slide, we'll, we'll talk about this more in detail. So, um, you know, the basics that the primary care uh, doctor ordered um, was a CDC that was with normal, with the normal limits had a normal IgG, IgM, and IgA, and normal vaccine response. Um, so this is not a uh, common variable immunodeficiency. We know that it's not specific antibody deficiency. It's not hypogamma globulinemia. Um, so we can rule that out. All right, next slide. So what we did next, um, among other testing, was checking for a condition called called chronic granulomatous disease. And um, dihydrobrotamine test um, was noted to be positive. In terms of the dihydrobrotamine testing, um, basically you can see on the right-hand side how we test. Um, so we stimulate um, a normal uh, person. Um, and if they're un unstimulated, you get that, um, that big bar, this triangular bar on the left column. Once they get stimulated, then you get significant movement of that bar to the right-hand column. Now, in the very bottom is an X-linked chronic granulomatous disease patient. And you see that despite stimulation, that, that did not move the bar towards the right-hand column. Um, and so that's consistent with chronic granulomatous disease. So um, this patient had an X-like form of the disease, um, which is derived from defects in the CYBB gene um, that encodes a glycoprotein of the NAPDH oxidase. So we'll go into a little bit more detail on that in a second. So next slide. Paula, I'm gonna interrupt you for a second, sorry. Mm -hmm. I would like you to explain how you went from point A to point B. So point A, you mm -hmm. ruled out those antibody deficiencies. You ruled out sort of the most mm -hmm. common of the rare. Mm -hmm. Why and when do you still go down that path of, it's not this, but I still think there's something with their immune system going on. Absolutely, I love that. So in this particular and child, there's significant red flags. So recurrent pneumonias, and then also recurrent abscesses. So that makes you think, oh gosh, you know, you don't um, tend to get recurrent abscesses that are significant, um, that require incision and draining in patients that have um, just humoral immune defect. So the phrase is a little bit of a flag for there may be more um, issues with outside of the humoral immune system, outside of the B cell, that are causing these recurrent abscesses. And that goes back to Ken's question. Now, you may be having abscesses for another reason, or um, is, there, is there something else going on? Is, is, that, is the next question with with um, with recurrent abscesses, we think of, okay, is this a problem with um, the innate immune system? So meaning um, typically abscess formation or a collection of neutrophils causing pus. So if you have a problem with the innate immune system, they may, there may be an increased um, issue of abscess formation and certain um, innate immune system defects. Additionally, T cell immunodeficiency can also lead into the current abscesses. And as um, Colleen pointed out, some of those hyper um, issues. So there's, two, there's overproduction of something can also cause recurrent abscess formation. So that holds this 12-year-old boy 
into a category that's, oh, this is not feeling like just normal common variable immunodeficiency, something else must be tested. Um, and in that something else, we do an effect, a significant evaluation that includes looking at the patient's T cells, looking at the patient's um, primary er, er, innate immune system, um, and things, basic things like HIV, et cetera. But we want to see the entire picture of the immune system to make sure that we're not missing a primary immunodeficiency or effects. Thank you. I just okay. want to make sure that no, thank you. clinicians understand you, you get to that first step and the answers are all, well, they're okay, but you still have Correct. those pneumonias that it's, are sitting there. You still have those abscesses that are sitting there. So if you're still sitting there going, yeah, but I still don't understand why whatever it is is going on that made you suspicious to begin with, you That's still right. need to dig deeper. That's right. That's right. And something like ordering a, a testing for chronic granulomatous disease, it's not something that I would expect a primary care provider to do. Um, I think that's when it, I did everything that I could as a primary care mm -hmm. provider, ordered some of these testing. This patient is still giving me concern. Let me, let me see if the immunologist can give me a hand because something isn't right in this little boy. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. So what is chronic granulomatous disease? And, and really, it is a heter hereditary disorder where um, there is a problem in either the activity is either completely decreased or absent in the phagocyte NAP NADPH oxidase. So what is that? If we look at the right-hand side in this figure, this is from a boss uh, textbook, you, when you have ingestion of bacteria at the level of the neutrophil, neutrophils do several different things. One, they have toxic granules and they can toss those granules into uh, an area um, to, to cause harm to the surrounding bacteria. They can also do this funky thing where they sort of, kill themselves and open themselves up and cause massive destruction in the whole area and severe inflammation. But they're also phagocytes and they can consume uh, bacteria or um, viruses in certain cases, but mainly bacteria and typically encapsulated organisms um, and can take them into their bellies or underbellies. And um, there they use a reactive oxygen species, uh, which is NADPH oxidase, to destroy that bacteria fully. Um, and if we don't have that ability of the NADPH oxidase, we have a defect there, then we're going to be eating bacteria into our neutrophil without an inability to kill it. And it's just gonna keep accumulating and accumulating and accumulating, causing significant pockets of neutrophils. So neutrophils get all the alarm signals to say, hey, I have an infection here, come come help. They're gonna keep coming, and but they're not gonna be able to help. And so they're gonna keep coming, keep coming, keep coming and cause something called a granuloma. A granuloma is simply a collection of walled off neutrophils. When neutrophils can't function, they have significant granuloma formation. And that's the case in chronic granulomatous disease. We can have granulomas anywhere in the body, but typically they can present in the liver, in the case, in the um, lungs, and in the cutaneous tissue, causing significant abscess formation in the cutaneous tissue or um, granulomatous uh, granulomas in the lungs, et cetera, with these recurrent pneumonias. So um, the the defect can be due to a dysfunction in any of the six genes that encode or permit the assembly of the subunits of this phagocyte NADPH oxidase. And there's uh, several um, pathogenic variants that are autosomal recessive, I named them here. Um, and then there's one pathogenic variant called CYBB, uh, which is the most common and it's the cause of X-linked 
CGD. And that's what this boy has. Importantly, the definitive treatment for chronic granulomatous disease is bone marrow transplant. And that's why early recognition and, um, of the disease is key. Um, next slide. And Paula, somebody so, put in the chat oh, yes. about um, the testing that Horizon Therapeutics has for free for CGD. Yes, thank you. That that was Rita, and Rita's one of my lovely colleagues. She works in our prime, in our in our clinic, um, and um, helps with absolutely everything. I don't think our clinic would function without Rita. But um, here, um, yes. So we do have availability for free testing for chronic granulomatous disease, and that could be I mean, even if you're feeling very comfortable as a primary I mean, a primary care provider or um, any other type of provider, um, you can certainly test this if you have a high index of suspicion. And then Portal Endless that um, gave you more information about um, testing and what CGD is uh, from um, in, in terms of ordering, et cetera. So, so kind of going back to, to this um, child, actually, can we do the next slide first? Yes, so this child, um, there are a lot of barriers to his diagnosis. Um, and so this really centers back into um, the social determinants of health lecture. So he had he had immigrated uh, to the United States and hadn't been recognized early in his life. Um, and even after he immigrated to the US at age three, um, Really, this, these recurrent abscesses and things like that didn't really map up. And it's possible that, you know, they were relatively mild, so no one really recognized them or they were being treated one after the other. But I do think language barriers played a role as he and his mother um, were both um, mainly Spanish speaking at the time. Um, and um, now he speaks fluent English, but. Um, but at the time, um, we both only spoke Spanish, and I think that's um, a big barrier to his care. Um, there was limitations in terms of lack of insurance um, when they arrived to the U.S. in terms of getting him uh, appropriately seen early on in his these conditions. Um, and it's important to note that um, you know delay of diagnosis can make the difference in this condition and other uh, conditions. It can make the difference between cure um, and lifelong disease with complications, which is the case with my patient. So we can go back to the last slide. Oh no, let the slide before. Sorry, Paula. That was the last slide. No, no, this the so, next to last. Go back. Okay. Oh, okay. Pre uh, so pre previous slide. Yep. Yes. Yep. So, so in terms of disease complications, so in, in one ideal case, right, we could diagnose these children early on um, and offer bone marrow transplantation. And that's been the case for many patients at our institution through the years. Now, chronic granulomatous disease is a rare disease, but even so, we see um, one patient or so every every year or, or every couple years um, in our institution, and they can get appropriately transplanted if they're diagnosed early. Um, however, when they're diagnosed much later, we've discussed that the risk of bone marrow transplantation becomes a lot higher, and then you know, you weigh benefits and risks. Um, and in this patient, when that was evaluated, it felt like because he was so old, 12 at presentation, that the benefits of the bone marrow transplantation um, did not outweigh the risks of having the potential complications that come with a bone marrow transplantation at age 12, especially given he had already had several infections, et cetera. So I see him now in my clinic, um, and he's more or less doing okay. Um, he uh, is 21, he's in college. Um, 
He has been since the time of diagnosis. Uh, we opted to treat him with prophylaxis, which is done for chronic brain rheumatoid disease patients that um, are not um, eligible for, for bone marrow transplantation. Um, and so for bacterial prophylaxis, we use uh, trimethoprim sulfur, um, and he uses that every day. Um, and then for fungal prophylaxis, we use itraconazole. And again, it's a medication that he uses every day. Um, he, another medication that we typically recommend for all patients undergoing prophylaxis for chronic granulomatous disease is interferon gamma. Um, and that we give administer three times a week typically, um, and it's an IV infusion. Um, he opted to not do this because of the side effects and the um, time commitment required for interferon. Um, he still gets abscesses uh, approximately one to two times per year that require incision and drainage. Um, has had a couple of pneumonias since his diagnosis, but in general has remained in fairly good health. Um, the big barrier um, for us recently that we are dealing with is significant hydrodenitis suppurativa, which can occur um, in a in a very strange way in patients with um, chronic granulomatous disease. And it's actually treated uh, very differently um, and managed very differently. And so we're um, working with him in terms of managing this because it's sort of, it's out of control. So a lot of complications in terms of um, how to take care of a patient that could have been cured but now has um, a lifelong, very difficult uh, disease. Um, and his care has been, you know, the last time he saw me in clinic, he said, you know, I've been, the hydrogenitis suppurativa is just so bad. And I just feel like the disease is getting to a point where I cannot live my life. And I, he was uh, somewhat suicidal. And so thinking about, um, you know, getting psychiatric services on board, supportive care, so a lot of this team-based approach um, because um, it is a complicated um, set of conditions. So that ends my case. Um, let me double check. Uh, so uh, Jackie did mention she she's going to do a, a talk a little bit to us about um, the um, final evaluations. Um, but it's been a joy and a pleasure for me to discuss with you and to be with you in this um, in this primary immunodeficiency series. Thank you. So just a reminder that you will be getting your email with a link to the session evaluation. That's for today's session. But you're also going to receive an email that has a link to a final evaluation that's looking at your experience over the entire series. So please watch for both of those. Um, and don't forget if you're claiming CME, you do need to complete today's session evaluation in its entirety. It's been wonderful having you all with us. We hope to see you again. And Colleen, I don't know if you have any final comments. I do, as usual, because it wouldn't be a meeting without me saying something. But I think the biggest takeaway that I want everybody who has attended these sessions to have, when in doubt, reach out. If you are questioning, listen to your patient, listen to what they're saying, if you have questions of your own, this is not normal, anything like that, reach out. You can reach out to your local immunologist. If you do not have a local immunologist, because there are places in this country that they don't exist, please reach out to IDF. We can help you as a clinician, find somebody that will help you with your patient. Please, 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 do not let them go undiagnosed another day or untreated another day. Paula's case study is a perfect example of a child who, if they had been caught at an early age, probably wouldn't have any suicidal thoughts. And so I just, when in doubt, reach out, please. And thank you, every person, for being here and for participating in this. And IDF is here to help. Penn State is, has been amazing to work with. And I thank all of you.
Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and we hope to see you again.